Welcome, super spies, rogue and redeemed to Splinter Cell Blacklist. I've been waiting to play this game for a long time, folks, and I have to thank longtime viewer Ostentatiousness for gifting me this game on Steam over six months ago before the game even released. I'm sorry it took this long. And Ostentatiousness has apparently decided that he wants to engage in this silly hobby of recording himself playing video games for the internet as well. So if you want to check him out and become one of his first 10 regular viewers, you can find a link to his channel in the description of this video. Anyway, back on track, Splinter Cell Blacklist is the ointment for the blemish that was Splinter Cell Conviction. It is unquestionably a stealth game, and a rather good stealth game at that from what I've seen so far. I'll be playing this game in the usual format, folks, where I play one or two missions off camera and then I'll do recorded runs. I have not played this game all the way through, I've only uh, played two missions so far, and what I've seen, I've liked. Now for our difficulty, there's lots to choose from, depending on how anyone wants to play the game. There's Rookie, Normal, Realistic, which is tailored for Splinter Cell veterans, if you say so, game. Or there's Perfectionist. Now this game, on the lower difficulties, does have Mark and Execute, but on Perfectionist, it does not. Sonar Goggles also cannot see through walls on this difficulty. The stealth and combat difficulty on this one are as high as they get, and there is no restocking at supply caches. Now additionally, I'm going to go for Ghost Mastery on this playthrough. You'll understand what that means when we actually get to a, a real mission, which will not be this video, regrettably. We're only going to go to the tutorial and kind of run through all of our things at our new base, as you'll soon see. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. find you no need general we're coming to America contract says no weapons not on this kind of op who needs to know General McGowan but this might make you feel better Little souvenir I picked up in Indonesia. Thanks, Vic, but if I need a karambit for aerial recon, we've got bigger problems. Can't hurt. Hey, where's Charlie with that sat phone? Huh? Hey, sorry. Just putting the finishing bits of awesome on this puppy. Signal skips base combo completely. What for? Keeps the DOD types from backseat driving. That's why you're here, kid. Sam. Let's move. Uploading. We're in. Teams, this is King. We are go. Pawn says go. Bishop says go. Knight says go. Rook is go. Queen says go. Anything else, Chief? Let Sarah know I'll be offline for a few days. Sarah, she's still single, right? No, that's... I'm gonna take that as a no. Stop hacking base IT. We're guests here. Yeah, but they make it so easy. Video's up. Engaging two hostiles. I've got it. Site F encryption keys, 40 days until expiration. Hostiles are down. Let's go. Jam everything and move out. The blacklist is live. Now. Anderson Tower, this is Paladin 02 requesting permission to lift off. Do you copy? Radio up. 
Radio's working fine. Anderson Tower, this is Paladin 02, requesting permission to lift off from Chopper Pad Alpha Niner. Well, we're behind. Fuck the protocol. Need to make it back in time from a Gallons Texas Hold'em game? How do you think I'm paying for the chopper? <laughs> Leave him. Bravo team report. Bravo is gone. Move in. Outside the perimeter. Check a light. We're a big target out here. Uh, uh, Vic, give me a hand, I'm stuck. Charlie Sackfold. Yeah. Oh shit, you guys okay? What the fuck is happening? Chopper's down. We're fine. Munitions depot must have been hit. Where are you? Hiding under a truck with my laptop with. Guys, all the radio channels are down. It's got to be an RF jammer. There's a signal northwest of you. All right, you sit tight. We'll find the jammer. Come on. Yeah, I'll bet those sons of bitches are using one of our jammers. What makes you say that? That's what I do. Eyes open, Sam. All right, finally time for a little gameplay. My God. Took us a while, didn't it? It's not gonna last long either. The guys behind us are pros. We're not even packing sidearms. Drainage ditch will give us some cover. It will give me a chance to run you through some of the gameplay differences between this game, Conviction, and the earlier ones. Jesus, that's not mortar fire. It sounded like Katusha's. I'm running! And again, space does about everything, just like in Conviction. Although it hasn't bitten me in the ass yet. Also, you notice that our gear flares whenever we're in shadow. The brighter it is, the darker it is. They don't move. You don't have to worry about any of that monochrome shit. Okay, all clear. Quick, give me a boost up. You got it, Vic. I'm as fast as I can <laughs> scramble for it. The cover system's still here, though. It works a bit differently. We press Q instead of using our right click now. Yeah. Get the camera going. And now we have how we switch weapons. We down. actually are switching between lethal and non-lethal right here by pressing B. Yeah, just we have to kill people here, by the way. There we go. You got it, Vic. Now, one thing that's different about this game than Conviction is speed. Speed is actually important in this game. Because if you go too fast, people will hear you and kill you. It's sort of nice. It makes it like a stealth game, right? It also knows how detection kind of works. You do have a slight delay before they notice. 
Uh, now I was talking about speed. You alter it with your caps lock, which is sort of strange. You can alter between fast and slow. And there's really no indication on screen which speed you're going, which is sort of a pain in the ass. All right, we're gonna go nice and slow here. Excuse me, sir. We're going to have to carry him out of here. There we go. Not a problem at all. Changing speed changes how fast you scramble on the ground like I'm doing now, how fast you climb, and how fast you walk and run. Let's go ahead and get going. There we go. And that's all the gameplay, folks. <gasps> I'm working on it. How's the kid? Don't ask. Charlie, we're in. All right, all right. All you need to do is disable the voltage oscillator and disrupt the competing signal. Just hold still. No talking, okay? Charlie, how about an on-off switch? Uh, do you see a blue button? Yeah. Hit it. What are you saying? What are you telling me, buddy? What are you telling me? Jeez. Jammer's offline, Vic. You can't stop the blacklist. Oh shit, Vic's already hurt and we're only 15 minutes in the game. Word of a stunning attack on the massive U.S. military installation on the island of Guam. The deadliest strike on a U.S. base since Pearl Harbor. A group calling themselves the Engineers has claimed responsibility. Released an internet video complete with chilling footage from the attack to lay out their demands. It's They're got calling more the like, the favorite, subscribe than any video list. on YouTube. This is the blacklist. the blacklist. One new attack every seven days. We, we have, have one demand. You have soldiers in 153 countries. Bring your troops home. Your troops home. Now. 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 Or every, every week, week, we will, will attack you. We will not negotiate. You will not stop the blacklist. blacklist. You have seven days until the next attack. The, the choice, choice is yours. We, we are, are the engineers. We are the engineers. Forgot what game it was. What's our status? Paladin 1 and the 4th Echelon team are ready, Madam President, but we can't locate Mr. Fisher. His friend is fighting for his life. Find Victor Cost, you'll find Sam. Hundreds dead in Guam, a countdown to more attacks targeting America. The world is looking for answers, Mr. Fisher, and I don't have any. Fourth Echelon needs to find them, and it can't do that without a leader. It's distraught, Vic. One of Vic's men comes with me, no questions asked. You can have Charlie Cole. And Grimm's daughter has recruited one of the CIA's best for mission support, Isaac Briggs. And Grimm is out. She didn't want you on this mission either. Sorry, Sam, that's a non-starter. Nobody works better with you than she does. Welcome to Fourth Echelon, Mr. Fisher. Fourth Echelon now, folks. It's been Alpha Protocol. It's pretty sweet, right? First time in a plane. No. Deeper with this engineer's organization? Nothing yet. Briggs and our contacts are isolating probable candidates. What about the names? American Freedom, American Blood. Potential attacks, each with a timer. Yeah, five days before American consumption? And counting. We're running analytics to find the target locations as we speak. I'll get you up to speed on the plane. Prototype military transport. Loaded with custom modifications. Armory, infirmary, holding cell. Every resource that you'd have on the ground. Fully mobile. It's like the good old days. Problem breaks? Just got my subdermal radio put in. Feel like someone used a jackhammer. This puppy makes Air Force One look like a paper airplane, hey Sam? 
Do you want to discuss potential upgrades? Later. I'm walking through this. News and internet data mining, predictive analytics, photo and video forensics. Plus backdoors into foreign ELIN systems and facial recognition integration from the CIA, NSA, DCS, FBI. All in real time. This is what you were bragging about? Yes, am I? Strategic mission interface. We've made significant improvements since the early system Charlie worked on. I'll let him get you up to speed. The best thing is, you can control everything from right here or from your opsat when you're on the ground. Impressive. Okay, well, let me know if you need anything. I'm gonna check out my new digs. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, I think it's about time we did the same, folks. Now, this is sort of our hub level here and our main menu, because we can do about everything from here. And there's a lot of stuff to do, like extras. We're gonna go into extras real quick. There's things called dead drops. We'll find these on all the single player and fourth echelon missions. Fourth echelon missions are side missions, folks. This game is gigantic. It seems like it's gonna have more missions than any Splinter Cell game that we've played so far. At least 20 plus, because we have uh, essential team members like Grimm's daughter, Briggs, Charlie, and someone else, and it seems like they have four each, and then we're gonna have like 10 or 13 main single player levels. That's just insane. Also, Sam, <laughs> settle down, buddy. Let's look at a few more of these things in our extras. We have concept art. Uh, the first thing is unlocking the concept art. Search the Paladin to find recon data and unlock new concept art from the Splinter Cell Blacklist development team. Look again after each com, uh, campaign mission and after finishing all of Isaac Riggs' fourth echelon missions. So we already have some in here. We have like Spies vs. Mercs, which is the competitive multiplayer of this game. So we have some concept art of several of the maps. We have our op suit here. He has like four toes. Something funny is going on down there. And then, of course, we have just regular Sam Fisher, as we saw him earlier. That's his, I guess that's his hub gear is what it says. <laughs> it literally is a hub level. They refer to it as hub gear. And then we have our goggles. Or these are goggles and gadgets. We have quite a few goggles. And then we have this. This mysterious image here, the Tri-Rotor, which is a new gadget we'll be playing with later in the game. And then we have some concept arts of weapons, which I will not be using in this one because if I haven't mentioned it yet, I'm going for Ghost Mastery, which will make sense next episode when we actually finish it. So here we have the pistol, we have the SMG, or this is the 400S, which is kind of weird. The 4000, which it seems like we have a larger caliber bullet looking at those magazines. And we have the shotgun. And a sniper rifle. All cool things. So as far as those, like, little data drops, this is what they look right, like right here. This is the recon data. So if we pick that up, we'll see that we have concept art from our little... <laughs> our tiny little tutorial mission. There you go. There's Coldwell right there. I don't remember that part. What else do we have in our extras? There's lots of stuff, and I am going to go through all of it. I may not read all of it, but I will look through all of it. So here we have our hostile intel. So our first one are mercenaries. The engineers have deep pockets, allowing them to recruit allies everywhere they go. Many of their operatives are highly trained professionals, making them dangerous adversaries to Sam and his team. And let's see, we have another page here. Hostiles equipped with helmets are resistant to headshots. That's not really a big problem for me because I won't be shooting them in the head if you know I have my choice about, which I do. Executing an enemy with a helmet will shoot the helmet off if you use mark and execute. It won't kill them. In co-op, you can actually invite your teammate to dual execute these targets, one shooting off the helmet and the other one kill delivering the killing shot. And now, what everyone definitely wants in their Splinter Cell game, guard dogs. We haven't had these for a while and oh my god, I'm so glad they're back. Guard dogs can smell and track intruders from a distance without line of sight. When alerted, their barks draw the attention of nearby hostiles. Dogs move quickly and low to the ground, making them hard targets to hit with a gun. In combat, dogs bite and won't let go, unless you mash E, which makes you pound their heads. Avoid attracting dogs' attention by staying off the ground using pipes and ledges, or by kicking them in the head, or using sleeping gas, or you know, stun guns, sticky shockers, all those are good against dogs. Bullets work too. 
I am not a dog lover in this game for sure. And now we have a new kind of infantry, folks, that we've never seen before. The Heavy Infantry. Heavy Infantry wear thick body armor, allowing them to advance more aggressively. Their helmets and gas masks protect them against headshots and gas grenades, being sleeping gas grenades and tear gas. Heavy Infantry armor makes them immune to electro electrical weapons as well, including the stun gun and the sticky shocker rounds from the crossbow, which we don't have yet, or the tri-rotor, which we also don't have. They fend off hand-to-hand -hand attacks from the front because they are well-trained. So attack from behind or above. Or not at all for that matter, because you might be playing this as a stealth game. In co-op, heavy infantry can take Sam and Briggs hostage if they get too close. Try, uh, try using incendiary grenades to clear out these tough enemies, or avoid them. You can also pick up their riot shields if they happen to be using one, which is pretty neat. Let's see, and then we have snipers, which we've had before, but these ones are a little different. Snipers are extremely, or snipers use extremely long-range weapons, surveying large areas for signs of any sign of threat. Watch for the telltale laser sight when snipers are in the area. They are required to use them by terrorist regulations. Snipers' scopes let them detect you at long range, even when you're hidden in the shadows, which is bullshit, but it's the way it works. Stick to cover to cover to stay hidden from their laser sight. Up close, snipers are forced to switch to their sidearm, use cover to cover, and the tri-rotor to close the distance between uh, the sniper and yourself without exposing yourself to fire. And now we have another new kind of threat. We have drone operators, and I haven't met these yet, but they look like they're going to be fun. Or <laughs> frustrating, I have no idea yet. Drone operators deploy remote-controlled recon drones to search for anything out of the ordinary. Drones can roam along floors and ceilings. On site, they ram any intruder and detonate like a grenade. Think about an excitable dog with C4 inside its stomach. That's how I'm imagining these little rascals down here. Operators also emit a jamming field which scrambles night and sonar vision modes. The tri-rotor's frequency is unaffected, however, through reasons. So it can be used to hunt down the source of the jamming. Sticky EMPs temporarily short out operator systems, by the way. And then we have the Commandos, which are your top-of-the-line fighters, who are like the third echelon splinter cells from Conviction, I'm guessing. Commandos use fast reflexes and smoke grenades to outflank opponents in combat. Their goggles can spot you even through the shadows and smoke. In co-op, commandos can also take Sam or Briggs hostage if they get too close. I just realized I haven't mentioned it yet, but Briggs is sore player too. Counter their smoke screens with sonar goggles and use flashbangs to counter uh, their goggles and their quick reflexes. And then we have our last hostile, military police. While these are not really enemy combatants, they will attempt to prevent you. They may pretend that they may attempt to prevent you from completing mission objectives. Avoid confrontation or use non-lethal methods if necessary. If spotted by an MP, freeze before they open fire. Then wait for an opening to silence them with a non-lethal attack, maybe hand-to-hand, -hand, mark and execute with the stun gun or the crossbow. Now we have our assets, which are definitely new. The Paladin, Paladin 1 Mobile HQ, a retrofitted military plane, which we are currently in, reading this stuff. Fourth Echelon's Mobile HQ contains everything to support an agency in the field. Amenities include a command center with the strategic mission interface, living quarters, an R&D lab, and even a holding cell designed by Anna's Grimm's daughter, Anna Grimm's daughter's specifications. It has a cruising speed or a cruising range of over 3,000 miles and a maximum payload of over 300,000 pounds. Now for the SMI, the Strategic Mission Interface, a powerful Google Analytics engine that provides actionable intelligence for the team. The strategic mission interface sits at the center of the command control. I'm standing next to it right now. It is tapped into media sources as well as communication satellites, various internet trunk cables, and other feeds. Thanks to Charlie, it also has backdoor access to databases of dozens of intelligence agencies around the world because they don't have good technology, folks. Oh, what else do we have? We have our gadgets. But we have night vision and whatnot, but you know how that works. I guess sonar vision's a little different because for some reason you can track cables with it. I, I don't know why, but it's a thing. 
And of course, night vision works like night vision. We have noisemakers. You know how those work. Sticky cameras are about the same, although you can upgrade them to self-destruct and kill nearby enemies. Also, you can give them a flash effect too. By default, they only show out sleeping gas, so there's not really any reason for me to upgrade them. Let's see, what else have we got? We have the sticky MPs, which are new. It sticks to walls and delivers a localized electromagnetic pulse, dis disabling lights and security systems nearby. Use it to create shadow paths to hide from hostiles or to target power boxes near laser trip wires to shut them down. Hostiles are unaffected by the pulse, unlike the EMP grenades of conviction, but they will investigate to see why the lights are suddenly shutting off for no apparent reason. Here's another thing that's completely new, the Tri-Rotor, which is our personal UAV. Well, it, well, I guess it is unmanned. It's remote control, a remote, pilotable flying drone that, fly, uh, that fires sticky shocker darts. Its rotors can be heard by hostiles if you get too close, though. Use the Tri-Rotor to scout out areas and mark hostiles if you have mark and execute, which we don't on this difficulty setting, or you can actually lure them out of cover or maybe away from Sam using the Z key. It'll make noise. Upgrade to gain the ability to self-destruct because you definitely want to blow up this expensive piece of technology or to emit sonar, pulse sonar pulses. Sonar is unavailable on the Perfectionist difficulty or near drone operators, so it's kind of worthless to me. Uh, drone operators cannot jam its main video frequency, as we already know, so they can't jam the controls or the video, strangely enough, for reasons. Smoke grenades, you know how those work. Tear gas is a new thing, but it's kind of self-explanatory. It just temporarily incapacitates hostiles. They will get better. You have sleeping gas, which we've had before, but it's usually called just gas grenade. And of course, that silently and non-lethally subdues groups of hostiles at a time. It's very nice, but the tear gas and the sleeping gas, remember, are un does not affect hostiles wearing gas masks. You have to actually shoot off their face masks, strangely enough. <laughs> before you can actually put them to sleep, which is kind of silly. And we have flashbangs, you know how they work, frag grenades, incendiaries, raging charges, which we've never had before, but probably not something I'm going to be using too often. You can use them for distractions, though, which I might use them for. It depends how the game feels, because uh, if your enemies get excited, you cannot actually get Ghost Mastery. You'll see how it works later, I assure you. It's going to happen in the next video. And then we have Proximity Shocker Mines, which are new. When hostiles come close, the actually I like to read it like this. When hostiles come close, the Proximity Shocker Mine fires electrodes in all directions, delivering a high voltage electrical shock to anyone nearby, similar to the stun gun. Unlike other electrical weapons, Oh, oh, I should say, like other electrical weapons, heavy infantry are not affected. Unlike the standard proximity mine, it is silent, strangely enough, and non-lethal, making it suitable for guarding Sam and Briggs backs, even on stealth ops. I, I, like I was saying before, I don't know how it'd be silent when someone's going, Oh, Jesus, why? <laughs> and of course, we have proximity mines. We've had those. Those are essentially wall mines, right? We have a mission log, that's just what happened last time, and then we have our persons of interest, which are definitely interesting. The first one being, of course, Sam Fisher, the director of the Force Echelon. The original Splinter Cell Sam Fisher returned to active service to spearhead the initial third Echelon field initiative at the request of his friend, Irving Lambert. He served until shortly after Lambert's death during the infiltration of a domestic terror group called John Brown's Army, at which point he walked away. Drawn back by Anna Grimm's daughter, he stopped the DCMP event of Splinter Cell Conviction and left the corrupt third echelon in ashes. Reunited with his daughter, Sarah, he chose to work part-time for Vic Cost instead of rebuilding the agency. Now tap the lead, third echelon successor, Sam must combine his unparalleled skills as a field agent with the leadership necessary to forge a team and stop the blacklist. Used to working on his own and as own initiative, he now must reinvent himself as a leader without losing his edge. Then we have, actually, since I'm here, I should, I, I didn't bring it up yet, but you may notice that Sam sounds entirely different than he has in any prior game. It's because the gravelly tones of Michael Ironside are no longer caressing your ears as they did in those other games. Instead, we have 
a uh, completely different voice actor by the name of Eric Johnson. And you may ask, why? Well, it's mostly because uh, Ubisoft Toronto, you'll notice that this game is not made by Ubisoft Montreal or Shanghai. This is Ubisoft Toronto's very first game. But anyway, they decide to use this crazy new mocap technology that lets voice actors do the motion capture for the face and body while they do the voice acting. And Michael Ironside, in his 60s, just is not in shape to do some of the monkey man stuff that Sam Fisher does. And probably some of the, you know, other physical things like taking down dudes, you know? So that's why we have Eric Johnson. I think it was a poor decision because Eric Johnson sounds nothing like Sam Fisher. And I hate to say it, Eric Johnson, but you sound pretty unremarkable next to Ironside. I don't know the Sam Fisher's talking when I hear you. Next, we have Anna Grimm's daughter, a trusted advisor. And of course, she's our operations uh, specialist. A trusted, uh, uh, a trusted advisor to President Patricia Caldwell Anna Grimm, Grimm's daughter, was Sam Fisher's controller and Third Echelon's best analyst. When Tom Reed began his campaign of sedition, Grimm remained a part of Third Echelon by the direct request of the president. There she worked undercover Reed's plans, ultimately bringing Sam Fisher back into the mix and working with Sam to foil the assassination attempt on the president. The force behind, fourth the, force behind the Ford Echelon initiative, she's the uh, she's key to getting Sam the intel he needs to choose his missions and to survive them once he's in the field. Grimm spearheaded the development of the strategic mission interface, turning bleeding edge analytics to the pursuit of fourth echelon's targets. As the team's liaison to the White House, Grimm maintains a strong relationship with President Caldwell. She also oversees the team's budget and HQ, directing improvements to the Paladin as needed. And that's right, she actually does do that. Now, if you were a student, you'll also notice that Grimm's voice is different, too. I'm not exactly sure why they changed her voice actor. Uh, it's usually, her voice is usually done by a woman by the name of Claudia Besseau. Uh, in this one, she's uh, voiced by a woman by the name of Kate Drummond, if I remember correctly. So there you go. Next, we have this insufferable son of a bitch, Charlie Cole the fourth echelon technology specialist. A brilliant hacker and tech geek, Cole got himself into trouble at an early age with some of his online exploits, and in doing so, he attracted Anna Grimm's daughter's attention. Working for, he, uh, working for her, he helped, he helped design the original strategic mission interface prototype, but his work habits and insufferable attitude clashed with Grimm's more professional style. Picked up by Vic Koss when Grimm couldn't take him any longer, Charlie, Charlie views Vic as a father figure. An instinctive smartass, Charlie is cocky, arrogant, and almost, a, almost as good at his job as he thinks he is. What else about this guy? Charlie provides technical support to Ford Ethel, Fourth Echelon that complements Grimm's analytical skills. Plugged into a worldwide network of white hats and other, less reputable characters, he puts his considerable resources at the team's disposal, sometimes even when the team doesn't want it. Charlie also heads the onboard R&D efforts. Improvements in weapons, body armor, field gear of the team are his department. The research and development department. And now we have player two, also known as Isaac Bridge. Or Briggs, I should say. Not Bridge, Briggs. He is, of course, a field agent and a by-the-book CIA officer. Briggs was the first to see the signs of the impending blacklist. Cool, analytical, and ruthless. Briggs pushed his findings, but his warnings were disregarded in the weeks leading up to, a, to the attack by the CIA. However, Anna Grimm's daughter had been following his career with interest, and when Briggs fell out of favor with the CIA, she quickly seconded him to the fourth echelon. Seconded to the fourth echelon, he serves as Sam's support and player two in the field. As well as being a superb analyst, Briggs is a skilled marksman and driver, and his talents complement Sam's in the field. Briggs comes to fourth echelon with a formal approach to fieldwork, which sometimes clashes with Sam's more freewheeling style. Is he really that freewheeling if you say so? And of course we have our good old buddy Vic Koss, who is actually voice acted by the same guy, Howard, uh, Howard Siegel, 
He just doesn't sound, his sort of weird way of speaking isn't as pronounced, at least that I'm finding. Maybe later in the game if he survives this whole grenade thing. I'm not even sure if he does yet. And of course, he's the head of Paladin 9 Security. Sam Fisher's oldest friend runs Paladin 9 Security, a private military company that employed both Sam and Charlie Cole. The only man Sam trusts with his back, Koss puts his life on the line to defend the man he calls brother. Now, of course, he's got to defend, he's got to, you know, trust Briggs with his back now, but he doesn't trust him that much yet. And now, of course, we have Sam's daughter, Sarah Fisher. Sarah Fisher, or Sam Fisher's only child, his daughter Sarah, lives in Atlanta, Georgia. She was reunited with Sam during the events of the DCMP event in Splinter Cell Conviction, after years in which both thought the other was dead. Sarah had, in fact, been given a new identity by Ada Grimm's daughter, acting on the order, orders to head off threats against Sarah that might be used as leverage against Sam Fisher. Sarah is the only family Sam has now, and the two remain close following their reunion. Yeah, she didn't really die in that whole double agent thing. It was a bunch of bullshit, and we've already covered it. Now, finally, we have Patricia Caldwell, the President of the United States of America, who has a very coincidental resemblance to Hillary Clinton. America's first female president, Caldwell, was re-elected after a shocking assault on the White House by unknown terrorists during the DCMP event. I can understand why you don't want to say, well, the, the uh, NSA sort of tried to, um, you know, command an act of sedition. <laughs> they kind of want to keep that under wraps, you know, for the image. Adjusting her policies to focus more on national security, Caldwell tasked Anna Grimm's daughter with developing a blueprint for an elite black ops, black ops team that would report directly to the Oval Office and hopefully not try to shoot her in the back. Her new fourth echelon was designed to prevent another institutional failure like the one that corrupted third echelon and nearly brought down the presidency. Pragmatic and blessed with a Midwestern directness, Caldwell views everything else as secondary to getting results. And that's all of our persons of interest, folks. Now for our organizations. My goodness, there's so many interesting things that we're learning about. How about the fourth echelon, our new thing, that for some reason has four stars, even though it's, or has five stars, even though it's the fourth echelon. A blacker than black special ops group reporting directly to the president. Fourth Echelon was the brainchild of Anna Grimm's daughter. She envisioned a mobile task force that would marry top flight intel gathering and analytics to bleeding edge tech and the best field operatives available. The advent of the blacklist attacks convinced President Caldwell to activate Fourth Echelon as a response, handing leadership over to the incredible Sam Fisher. And now we have our main antagonists, the Engineers, an international terror organization. A faceless terrorist collective introduced to the world through their terrifying and popular Blacklist YouTube video. The Engineers are dedicated to carrying out a sequence of devastating attacks on the United States of America. They claim they want the United States to remove all of its troops from foreign soil, but their mysterious leader may have a more sinister agenda. One that leads to the heart of American power. Love how they tease us there. The Blacklist is the name of in the Blacklist is the name the engineers give to the series of attacks they are launching against the U.S. Each attack has a specific name: American Power, American Blood, American Furniture Warehouse, and many more, and a specific but unknown target. To increase the panic the attacks will cause. The engineers also keep a running countdown of the time until the next attack is a constant reminder of the inevitable threat and to be dicks. All right, and then we have third echelon. You know a story about this. It was of course spearheaded by the late Colonel Irving Lambert. Third echelon was cal a calculated response to the exponential increase in operational data received by U.S. intelligence agencies. Amongst, amongst its projects was the Splinter Cell Initiative, whereby elite agents would act on intelligence to prevent or perpetrate acts of data warfare that would ideally prevent larger conflicts. The first Splinter Cell, of course, was Sam Goddamn Fisher. After Lambert's death, 
the agency fell into disarray, with leadership going to Colonel Tom Ree. Ree collaborated with the international organization Megiddo to attempt to assassinate President Caldwell. This plan was discovered by Sam Fisher, who dismantled 3rd Echelon HQ during his attempts to prevent the DC EMP event. Now that's actually not what fucking happened. He did not he did not dismantle the HQ. You'll remember that the code went over the radio and they started they started a cleanup operation. It was not Sam's fault. They did it. They did all on all on their own. They they said the they said the code. Anyway, after the attempted assassination, the agent we the agency was formally dissolved. And now we have another organization we've never heard of. Voron. The Russian equivalent to fourth, uh, the third echelon, not fourth echelon, Voron is literally Raven, and it is a black bag directorate largely focused on data warfare and industrial sabotage. Part of the SBR, Voron has a near complete autonomy and is actively engaged in field operations ranging from extractions to IP theft and also sabotage and assassination. I'm guessing they're still, they're actually like pirating stuff on the torrents. Mm -hmm. Or they're still in IP addresses, which is even more nefarious. At one point, they attempted to recruit Sam Fisher. And I, I, I don't know when that happened. I don't think that uh, happened in a game, but I don't remember. I, I, I don't remember that. Paladin 9 Security, licensed PMC. Victor Cause private military company dedicated to the notion that it is possible to turn a profit without turning to immoral methods. Based in Washington, D.C., moments from the White House, it provides a variety of security, training, opera and operational services to governments and private individuals that can meet both the price and Vic Cause standards for clients. Sam Fisher worked for Paladin 9 as a contractor in the months leading up to Blacklist. He and Vic are, were in Guam, you know, con coincidentally enough, to start a recon mission, which we don't know about, when the first blacklist was triggered on top of their faces. Now we have the mysterious Megiddo, which we had in Conviction as well, and we still don't know what it is. I'm not sure if it's going to be revealed in this. An international cartel dedicated to maintaining and expanding its wealth, much like many other cartels, Megiddo orchestrated the DC EMP event in order to replace Caldwell with the more pliable vice president, which I can't remember his name at the moment. Decentralized and globalized, its individual companies, or it uses individuals, companies, and terrorist groups, and governments as pawns, pawns interchangeably to advance its members' agendas. Megiddo's leadership, capabilities, and long-term goals are unknown at this time, most maybe because the writers haven't thought of anything yet. And I'm going to read the... De the uh, Fifth freedom, because we're almost done here. The other stuff you already know about, right? I mean, that's just conviction. This is double agent. But the fifth freedom, it needs to be read. The fifth freedom is the rarely granted power issued by the President of the United States of America. It is the formal investment of power to take whatever steps necessary to protect the other four freedoms spoken of by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his landmark speech. An individual with the fifth freedom may perform any illegal acts they deem necessary, up to and including killing, in the pursuit of the greater good. To date, only one individual has been granted the fifth freedom twice. Sam Goddamn Fisher. And here's the other ones, just in case you do want to read through those for whatever reason. And now while we walk around the Paladin for a bit. Actually, have I looked through all the... Uh, yeah, I think I did look through all the concept art. So we'll go over here and... Tell our daughter where we are. Let her know we're okay. Hi, sweetheart. It's me. Dad, hi. How are you? I saw the news in the Blacklist video, and it's... I'm fine. I can't tell you where I am or what I'm doing, but... Of course you can't. But you're okay? And Uncle Vic's okay? Vic... It's part of why I called. Vic got hurt in Guam. Hurt bad. But he's gonna be alright. Tell me he's gonna be all right. Well, you know, he's tough. And they're gonna take good care. That's not an answer, Dad. Where is he? Walter Reed, I could be there in an hour. Look, you don't have to do anything. He's on a med back plane to Landstone. Charlie's keeping tabs on him for me. As soon as you hear something, anything you let me know, okay? You hear me, Dad? Yeah, I will. Right now, I, uh, I gotta go. Of course you do. Just 
let me know you're alive once in a while, all right? <laughs> I will. I love you, Dad. Love you too, kiddo. Well, that's just heartwarming. All right, let's go ahead and walk around the ship. So, I call it ship. It's actually a goddamn airplane, right? Let's talk to Grim. She's kind of important. Sam, I think Charlie's got some new gear he's working on. Okay. Grim. Listen, Sam, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Thought maybe we should clear the air. History is history. That's it? Like you said, we've got a lot of work to do. All right, and when we talk to her, we can actually upgrade the plane so we can look at some of this stuff. We can actually upgrade the cop cockpit that'll give us a, a radar on our HUD, and level two will actually give us extended radar. It's pretty cheap. There's no reason not to get this. Why do I have any money? That's weird. Huh. Strange. Not sure why I don't have any money. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. I don't need your money. <laughs> Yeah, I know I don't have any money. I was just looking at Charlie's workshop. Charlie's workshop, we can get some more stuff. We can get, we can unlock the pro prototype SMG shotgun, the pistol, the assault rifle, and the sniper rifle. All the stuff that I won't use in this playthrough, because of course, uh, I'm going for Ghost Mastery, which killing people will not get you. And then we have this one, which is very nice for the command control. We can reveal dead drop locations. And we can reveal all the secondary objectives from further away. These are just helpful for you. All these upgrades, by the way, increase this down here, the fourth, e fourth echelon multiplier. And the higher that is, the more money you get from finishing missions. I'm still confused why I don't have any money. That's weird. Usually you have 70 grand. I'm not sure why I don't have 70 grand. Upgrading the infirmary will get you faster regeneration and faster, even faster generation, which is pointless for me because I don't plan on getting shot. And then we have crew quarters, which gets us additional loadouts, which are completely worthless. And then we, of course, have the cargo hold, which uh, lets us customize gear in the field. Except on, perfe on perfectionists, so that's additionally worthless for me. She also has missions. This game has an incredible amount of side missions, if I haven't mentioned it yet. Something just came in from a contact in Benghazi. I'll follow up with you later. Alright, so we'll leave her to her devices. In more ways than one. Briggs, you settled in yet? I'm working on it. I usually get a lot more prep time before I'm wheels up on a mission. CIA is too big to move fast. Operation like this has got to be agile if it's going to work. Understood. Just wish I had a little more planning time. You'll adjust. All right, and he has his own set of missions. All are co-op, though, so I'm going to have to get Revocane or someone else to help me complete those eventually. Can't remember what progress was. What is progress? Ah, yes. Progress will just tell us our progress. Which, apparently, I completed one, one single-player mission. Okay. Which is kind of funny, because I... That was the it's tutorial mission. Looking forward to working with you, sir. Alright, that's cool. Alright, let's go ahead and head up. We gotta go talk to Charlie. Up. Damn it. Damn it! Setup almost complete, Charlie. Yeah, hang on. Ow! Oh. Hey. Hey, Sam. We're uh, pretty much good to go here. Just got to overclock a couple of components and then see if my supply rec gets approved by Her Majesty. Let me know if you have any problems. Okay. Pretty tricked out workshop, huh? I'll be able to upgrade and repair most of our equipment and if we've got enough cash and the right supplies, then I can test out some sick mods for your gear. Sounds like I'm in good hands. You know it. Hey, you need anything right now? Yeah. You might want to look into a helmet. Yeah. Thanks. All right, and of course he has his own set of missions, and we can also customize our gear using him or any of the cabinets in this room. And I could go through all this stuff. We can just get all of our gadgets. Some of these you have to buy in order, like the sleeping gas. Like, I can't, get, I can't get sleeping gas unless I already have tear gas, which is sort of dumb. Because I just want sleeping gas. Let's see, what else we got? We got goggles, so we can get, like, sonar pulse, footprint tracking, colorized night vision, ambient sonar, high-frequency sonar, long-range sonar, and whatever integrated optics are. I don't know what that means. It doesn't tell me either. I have to unlock everything else before I can get it. And you can see that these things are a freaking million dollars. We can also customize these, like slap ham on them, but as far as I know, it doesn't actually do jack squat. There's also exclusive content. I could get these alpha goggles. 
if I played some kind of mobile app, but I probably won't. We also have the op suit, and we can upgrade our torso, which will make us stealthier. Our gloves will give us better handling. Torso also increases the amount of stuff we can hold. Like, the first thing I'll probably get is this, which will give me more gadgets and more special mags. Special mags are for, like, stun guns and crossbows. Our pants will give, you, give us more of those slots and increase stealth. Our boots will give us more stealth. And our lights are just for, well, no reason whatsoever. They're just so we can change the color of our lights. Although I don't know why you'd use anything but green. If I wanted to, I could actually use my exclusive stuff and get a distinct advantage, but I'm going to avoid that. This is the Steam version, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it yet. Sort of a weird... A weird coexistence between Steam and Uplay, by the way, if you have the Steam version, because Steam starts up Uplay, and then Uplay runs the game through Steam. It, it, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. It's some kind of DRM circle jerk. What else can we get? We can get new pistols, and we can, of course, add attachments to those. All stuff I won't be doing. Uh, let's see, we have alternate weapons, which are about the same things. Just give you a quick rundown so you can see what we have. Don't want to spend too much time on this because this video is already so freaking huge. We also have a blacklist, which isn't available until we find an arms dealer. Which shouldn't be too much longer. And, of course, we have our special weapon. We have the stun gun, which we can't upgrade. And we have the crossbow, which is a freaking million dollars. <laughs> it's better be a pretty good... Or, actually, it's a hundred thousand dollars. Either way, it better be a goddamn good crossbow, right? I wonder if those goggles were actually a hundred thousand, too. I'm going to have to check. We're gonna check right now. Goggles were you? Okay, you were only 100,000. Still pretty pricey goggles. There's so many zeros, it's hard to find them, okay? Give me a break. All right. I've had nice enough work, looking Charlie. at your face. Thanks. He can be a bit insufferable at times, but uh, so far it hasn't been too bad, I guess. All right, folks, let's walk over to the SMI. You also see an infirmary, and there's also a loading bay, but there's really nothing in there yet. Also, I need to approach this thing from the correct side, otherwise it doesn't work. Hey, Sam. Almost forgot. You're offset. New and improved. It's sort of like your SMI light when you're on the ground. Data transmissions, drone controls, scanning. Gotcha. All you gotta do is slave it to the SMI, do a couple of calibrations, and you're good to go. Thanks, Charlie. All right, and of course, at this point, it wants us to adjust the darkness and the gamma and whatnot. <laughs> this game, I tell you what, folks. All right, and this is our mission select screen, folks. You'll see we have tons of stuff to do on here. This is one thing I really like about the game. We have several things we can go back. We can even go back to the, the first mission if I care to do so. I was going to say, let's take a look at that real quick. Let's see... Yeah, it's explaining how those actually work. No, this one... I, I was thinking maybe that's why I don't have any money. I'm still confused by that. I almost always had 70 grand. Oh, well. But you can see at the beginning of this game, you have a choice between missions. You can go right into the single-player campaign, or you can do one of these side missions. The one for Grim, the one for Charlie, or if you got a buddy, you can do Briggs's mission right here. And then you can have plenty of money to go into this one. So what will we do next time, folks? Find out then.